So are Angus cows getting too big? Quite a big topic in itself, pardon the pun. When we start discussing whether Angus cows are getting too big, it's important that we context this and reflect on the genetic improvement which has occurred within the Angus breed over the last 20 years. Angus breeders, both commercial and seed stock, have led the industry with the adoption of technology, be it reproductive technologies like artificial breeding, embryo transfer, or genetic improvement technologies and the adoption of performance recording and uh, utilisation of breeding values within their selection programs. And as a result of that, the Angus breed has made significant genetic improvement over the last 20 years. And there's different ways that we can measure that genetic improvement, but one of the ways we can reflect on that is to look at the change in the overall Angus breeding index that is calculated for Angus animals. And the Angus breeding index in this context reflecting the overall genetic improvement in, in the majority of, or in a common kind of production system. And at the moment, we, we've made, we're currently making around $3.70 per cow mated per year uh, genetic improvement in, for the Angus breeding index. Um, likewise, if in other kind of production systems, and that genetic improvement is even greater depending on the traits which impact on it. So in long fed production systems, as reflected by the uh, heavy grain fed index, uh, the current genetic improvement within the Angus breed is around $4.90 per cow mated per year. So it's been an outstanding achievement for, for uh, the Angus breed and it's testament to the great work of um, Angus breeders. If we look and break that down a little bit further and see, well, where has that genetic improvement actually occurred? And we can see that major the, the main reason we've made genetic improvement is effectively being able to put a lot more growth into our Angus cattle while not increasing our birth weight and therefore increasing our, um, our carbon differently as a result. So we've been able to really put in a, a, a lot of extra uh, growth and therefore decreasing the age of turnoff of, of Angus animals or, or making them heavier, um, depending on the production system. Um, and also made significant gains in carcass quality and, and the improvement in marbling in the Angus breed and increased profitability as a result of that um, is, is what's accounting for a lot of that current genetic improvement. But when we start to reflect on those great achievements, it's also important to see, well, what has actually happened to the weight of cows um, during that time and, and what has been the consequence, I suppose, of the increased selection on growth. And if we look at the genetic trend for, for mature cow weight or what's happened within, within the um, Angus breed, we can see now there's been an increase in the weight of Angus cows of around 40 kilos in the last 20 years. Now there's also been other changes in, in the weight of cows in what we see in the paddock due to changes in, in production systems. So uh, we've improved our pastures and our management and our, our animal health and things along those lines. But if we look at just the genetic component where we can break that down um, using, using technology that there's been a genetic increase of 40 kilos. So that means if we took um, Angus animals from 20 years ago and put them into current production systems, then they'd be 40 kilos lighter at, at maturity as the, the um, female breeding herd um, than current genetics. Or likewise, if we took our current genetics and put them in historic uh, production systems from 20 years ago, then they'd be 40 kilos heavier. Currently, if we look at our, our rate of change, then Angus cows genetically are getting about two and a half kilos heavier each year. So it's a trend and that's continuing to increase in a fairly linear fashion um, as we continue our push for selection on growth. Now, is that a problem? And that's, that's where this question really comes in. So are Angus cows now starting to get too big? And it's, it's a point which is, is not a new topic and is a significant point of discussion. And there's very wide ranging views on this topic. And we do look at some of the survey work that Angus Australia has conducted over the last 12 to 24 months. This is one trait where there doesn't seem to be a very clear consensus. So we get vast ranges of different opinions depending on the individual enterprise and the individual breeding philosophies of our breeders. And Angus Australia certainly doesn't have a position on this at all. Um, but if we start thinking about, well, how do people come up with and start to consider this question, then there's some key considerations that we need to think about. On the positive side, as we increase our, our, the weight and, um, and size of our cows, then we get increased returns for surplus females. And there's certainly been some, some big prices being paid for surplus females in, in recent years. So if we start thinking about that 40 kilos, if we're, we're getting paid $2.50 a kilo, then that equates to about $100 per head extra profit from that increase in that weight. But of course, increase of weight comes at the cost of, of a whole lot of different things and, and most particularly the increase in the feed requirements of our mature cows. So if we consider things like a, a, an extra 40 kilos, if, if a cow is eating 2.5% um, of dry matter per day, 
then that equates to about an extra kilo per day of dry matter or 365 kilos per head per year, increasing the maintenance requirements of our uh, female breeding herd. Now whether that comes at an economic cost and what that economic cost is really depends on our pasture utilisation. So if we've already, we're not utilising all our pasture um, and so we're, we're, we're producing more than we're, we're using, then we can increase our maintenance requirements and it doesn't come at any uh, significant cost. But if we're pushing, pushing the limit, pushing the envelope, um, we've got our, we're utilising most of our pasture um, and therefore an increase in, in maintenance requirements requires us to therefore go out and source feed, it'd be through pasture improvement or buying in supplementary feed or, or other type of techniques, then that comes at a cost and it really comes at the cost. The cost of that increase in maintenance requirements depends on um, what it costs us to, to meet that extra demand. We also have some other considerations in that we're, we're trying to um, put extra growth into our steers, in, particularly in some long fed feedlot systems for people who are breeding for that. Um, so we need those steers to be continually growing in those feedlot systems um, and often the age of turn off in those systems is at, is at 24 months. Um, so how do we put growth into those steers and continue to increase the growth in those steers um, while not necessarily increasing our cow weight too much. There's also another, we, we talk a lot about mature cow weight, but how do we consider the effect or the correlated effect on other traits like body composition? We've increased our, our, our weight by 40 kilos, but have we also changed the body composition of our cows and what effect does that have? So there are kind of the, the considerations and I think the, the general consensus amongst Angus breeders that I talk to and that Angus Australia talks to is we really need to be trying to, to focus on continuing to put growth into our cattle to, to ultimately decrease the age of turnoff but while moderating and, and continuing to get moderate cow size and as I said there's a lot of different philosophies about that but the challenge that, that I think we now have as, as an Angus breed is to start to breed what I would call the modern curve bender. So we've made big success over the last 20 years of putting extra growth into our cattle without um, increasing the birth weight and therefore the calving difficulty. So we've bent the, the, that growth curve. Now we need to start bending it at the other end where we continue to put growth in but hold our mature cow weight where it is. Um, we're also, that, that causes a whole lot, a range of different considerations. And some of the other considerations as we start moving forward is do we need to be better at, at using different size for breeding replacement heifers versus those that we're using to, to use our steers. And, and there's a whole lot of discussion which we can have around that. So they're just some, some of the thoughts, I suppose, around Angus cows that are getting too big. If we start thinking about how we might manage that and how we might um, address that going into the future, well, if we want to do anything with managing the, the genetics of our cattle for mature cow weight, then it all depends on whether we start to measure our animals. And if we look at the current levels of measurement within the Angus breed in terms of weighing cows, at maturity, then at the moment we have um, around just between 10 to, to 12,000 cows being weighed each year and mature cow weight sent into the Trans-Tasman Angus cattle evaluation, which represents about 20% of, of the cows, the breeding cows that are in the seed stock sector. And if we continue that, what we can only really describe as a very low level of recording of mature cow weight, and we're not going in and, and describing the genetics of our cattle well, then we're going to continue to increase. If we don't have a measurement at both 400 day weight, 600 day weight, and then through to maturity, then there's no way that we can identify those animals which follow a different growth pattern and use those within our selection. We'll continue to, as we push for higher 400 and 600 day weight, we'll continue to increase mature cow weight unless we start to measure mature cow weight. The other part of this, and I touched on it before, was around body composition. So we start looking at mature cow weights, and we've talked about that. But what we're actually doing to body composition is also a, a consideration. So are we increasing the weight of our animals um, and, and therefore breeding uh, taller, skinnier animals or are his body composition staying the same? And to address this again, we, we need tools that enable us to, to firstly describe the genetics of animals for those traits. So we go through and we, we've now, Angus Australia has in collaboration with uh, the animal science team at the University of New England, particularly um, Dr. Tom Granlees and Dr. Sam Clark has developed research breeding values for mature cow height and mature body condition. So mature body, uh, cow body condition uh, research breeding values are now available, um, providing genetic differences in the, um, the body condition of mature females. They're, they're reported in uh, differences in score units. So if we have two animals which uh, have a um, research breeding value that is um, two, two size, for instance, research breeding value um, half a score different, then all other things being equal, we'd expect that the sire with the higher breeding value to produce um, 
females that on average have a quarter of a score um, more body condition. Likewise, mature cow height uh, research breeding values, we, we now are producing those genetic differences in the, the height um, of animals at, at maturity, uh, produced in centimetre units. So again, if we have uh, two sires with a research breeding value for mature cow height, that is a, a 10 centimetre difference between those breeding values, research breeding values, then we would uh, expect to see the, their daughters on average being five centimetres taller. So there's a lot of further work that, that's required in this, um, trying to really describe the, the traits around body composition um, and, and also particularly their relationship with other traits and how we might, might use those in, um, in selection. But the intention now is we've, we're starting to set up um, systems and things so that we can update those research breeding values quarterly um, and ultimately start to provide some tools to um, our Angus Australia members and, and breeders of Angus cattle in Australia uh, with the tools to go through and describe the genetics of our Angus cows for not only weight, but also a height and body con con uh, condition, which can then be used to guide our selection decisions. One of the things when we talk about research breeding values that we need to be mindful of is they are research breeding values, they are still under development and they are still subject, I guess, to some change. So while they're out there and, and um, a useful thing for people to look at, we should use them with some degree of caution. Um, all those research breeding values now can be accessed off the Angus Australia website. Um, so there's, if we go to the Angus Australia website, go to the research menu, then you'll be able to download um, a, a report with some research breeding values of size. We're also in the process of setting that up so that those research breeding values will display within the Angus database search and people will be able to search and sort as they do for the other breeding values. A key message which I'll leave you with and really want to stress this point is if we start thinking about, again, are Angus cows getting too big? Uh, have we changed the body uh, composition of our animals? The only way we can manage this going forward is if we start to record this information. So we're really putting out um, and really would urge um, all Angus Australia members who are interested in this trait, interested in selecting on it and managing it going forward, to really start to collect these measurements on your cows. So record measurements at, at a minimum of all your cows at weaning each year, um, so take a measurement on each cow every year, take a mature weight as a minimum, but also I really encourage you to take a body condition score and a, a hip height measurement. Um, those measurements, as I said, need to be taken, they should only be taken for cows which are weaning a calf and need to be taken within two weeks of when you take the 200 day weights on those calves. You should record all measurements on the same day as much as possible um, and also if you're collecting body condition, um, make sure you're using the same scorer. Submit management group information alongside that information um, so that we can identify any, any non-genetic differences that, that might be occurred. So if there are cows which have been managed under different conditions, ensure you send in that management group information. Um, also when you submit that information, um, you can specify the time at measurement. So as I said, the, the, at the minimum we'd really like you to take those measurements when you, you're taking the 200 day weights or, or the weaning weights on those calves. For those that are really interested in assisting with this research, uh, we are interested in understanding whether this trait changes throughout the, the production cycle, so the time of year. So you also have the, the option and um, we encourage you to also submit those measurements um, either at joining or, or pre-carving and that will assist us to explain that. Um, there's also a range of different um, bits of work that we're doing now to try and describe the genetics of mature cows. So I encourage you to consider um, some of that other research um, and, and the, things like tech collecting um, structural scores on your cows, udder scores, etc. There's a whole range of information on the Angus Australia website. Um, there's also, in terms of collecting this information, the, the weight, body condition and um, height information, there's a range of resources on the Angus Australia website to help you with that. Uh, so we have collection uh, guideline documents. Um, we've also got a paddock guide for, for body condition scoring. There's also modules now available within the Angus Education Centre which will take you through all the considerations when you record this data. So again, I'd leave you with this, this question. Um, ultimately, as we, we start to go through, if we can better describe the genetics of, of Angus females for these traits, then we can start to use those in our uh, selection decisions and ultimately achieve the goal of what we're after, which is to try and breed more profitable Angus breeding females. Mm -hmm.